Shalom and greetings from Jerusalem. My name is Joan Lippis or hashtag Joni in Jerusalem of Novea Ministries. This is part two of a discussion, can the church celebrate the feasts of the Lord? And the reason why I've done this two-part series is because I've also designed a 12-week media interactive course where we can discuss the feasts. What does the Bible say about them? What are the prophetic implications? What are the significance to us today? And how can we develop our own traditions as the one new man? Look, we all have our distinctions. We are all part of the kingdom culture, but we all have distinctions without division. So absolutely, we can come up with some new ideas on how to celebrate. But let's get back to the issue right now. Now, in part one, before I answered the question, can the church celebrate the Feast of the Lord? We asked another question. Why not? Why can't the church celebrate the Feast of the Lord? So then we answered the first question with a resounding, yes, most certainly the church can celebrate the feasts of the Lord. In part one, I also shared my confusion when, as a Jewish follower of Jesus, I discovered that the holidays my family of the Spirit celebrated had become a point of separation. In other words, to my surprise, there was a difference between the holidays that the Jewish versus the Gentile believers celebrated. Jewish believers celebrated the Feast of the Lord. Gentile believers celebrated the Feast of the Church. Jews celebrated Passover. Gentiles celebrated Christmas. And yet, both we're celebrating the same Savior. Well, that led us to define terms because what we hear is processed through our personal grids and perceptions. And those definitions made a huge impact on our communication. The most important definition in our quest for answers is our definition of the church. The simplest and most biblical definition of what the Bible calls the ecclesia is Jewish and Gentile, Jews and Gentiles who have been redeemed by God's grace through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. But sadly, there are historical issues that have made the word or the phrase the church an emotional trigger to some. So therefore, I like to use another biblical term, the one new man. Regardless of the term that we use, the definition remains the same, Jewish and Gentile followers of Christ. Now, the second definition is another trigger word. This is the definition of Christian. Linguistically, the word Christian means Christ follower. But again, the perception of many, especially Jewish people, is that the word Christian applies only to Gentile followers of Christ. In fact, to some people, Gentile and Christians are synonymous. Let me repeat that. Regardless of faith or lack of faith, to some, Gentile equals Christian. Now, if we take that perception a step further, then we really have a mess. If Gentile equals Christian, then Billy Graham, the Pope, and Hitler are all Christian. <clears throat> so given that quite erroneous perception, if the word Christian applies only to Gentile followers of Christ, the word becomes inappropriate to Jewish followers of the Messiah. So over the years, we have two distinct terms to define followers of Jesus. Christian for Gentiles, Messianic for Jews. But we're not done yet. We clarified what has been referred to as the Jewish feasts, but that's the wrong terminology. 
Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Are we done? Not yet. Because the word translated in English as feasts actually applies to something quite different. We see it in the book of Esther when the king had a, a feast for 180 days for all of his nobles and officials, and boy, the wine must have been flowing. Well, that's not the kind of function that God wants to bless. So before we look at Leviticus 23, let's go back to the fourth day of creation, Genesis 1, 14 through 19. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. God's creation of the sun and the moon were for signs and seasons. And those signs and seasons determine the seasons of harvest, spring, summer, and fall, times of sowing and reaping. And that's why three times a year, God required the Jewish men to bring the first fruits of their harvest as a time of thanksgiving and celebration. Later, Israel added two non-harvest holidays in the winter. So the Hebrew word is defined as signal, distinguishing mark, a banner. But more important to our study is the word translated as season, or in Hebrew, moad. And the best definition of moad is appointed time, appointed place, appointed meeting. And that is the word which God used to define the various times he appointed to meet with his people. Now we go back to Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, These appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my appointed times to meet with my people. So let's rephrase our question. Does the church really want to ignore celebrating God's appointed meeting times? I think not. There were a few other distinctions, all of which our English Bibles call feasts. In Hebrew, there's the Hag, Holy Convocation, and Shabbat Shabbatim, all of which I, I explain in my book, Celebrating the Lamb, which you can find at novea.org. So why celebrate? At the heart of our discussion is this simple question. Is celebration a part of our worship of God? Now, we don't see the word celebration very much in our Bible, but what we see is joy and rejoicing, or in Hebrew, simcha. God expects his people to be a people of great joy, and we do have much to rejoice about, don't we? Well, let's look at some scripture. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. Psalm 89, verses 14 through 16. And you know this psalm. 
Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with joy. Come before his presence with singing. Now, joy is the response of a grateful heart. Consider this warning in Deuteronomy 27. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. Yes, friends, it is very appropriate for the church to celebrate God's appointed times. So let's prepare because here come the naysayers. Probably the number one criticism, rejection of celebrating God's appointed times is the challenge that we're trying to Judaize the church. Now, how ridiculous can you get? For 2,000 years, the church has worshiped a Jewish savior and read a Jewish history book written by 44 Jewish prophets, apostles, pastors, and teachers. And they're afraid we're Judaizing the church? So let's start by reminding ourselves of God's design for his appointed meetings as we suggested in part one. One, remember God's mighty acts of deliverance for Israel. Two, reveal God's character. Three, recognize Jesus. Four, Reflect on the personal significance of each of the feasts in our lives today and rejoice. Okay, stop. You want to say, just stop right there. Go back to number one. Number one, remember God's mighty acts of deliverance for Israel. And the naysayer will say, what does God's acts of deliverance for Israel have to do with the church today? And do I really care? <laughs> well, God spoke and continues to speak to the world, to the Gentiles, to the church, through his relationship with Israel. It doesn't matter what condition or form of Israel as a nation, whether it's a family of 70 in Egypt, or the 12 tribes marching through the desert, or the kingdom under David, or the split kingdom. What about the captivity? And what about the dispersed throughout all the nations? What about the modern state of Israel today in the land? Friends, Israel remains God's witness to the world. His plans and his purposes haven't changed, and Israel remains the epicenter of biblical history, past, present, and future. Therefore, what God did for and through Israel in the past still has a significance to us today. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. So why celebrate? Well, again, let's listen to the psalmist. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. All your work shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. Over and over and over, we're hearing the same refrain. And here's the key. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Celebrating God's appointed times keeps these powerful acts of deliverance from just being relegated to children's Bible stories. As long as we remember and rejoice together, they remain living events in our lives. And as we partner with God in his mission to fill the earth with the knowledge of his glory, 
the obvious response as his glory fills the earth is to celebrate. Inherent in celebrating the feasts are blessings upon blessings. So let's consider three. Number one, it creates a community of the kingdom. Now we've hinted at the breach between Jewish and Gentile followers of Christ as evidenced by the differences of, of the holidays that we celebrate. So isn't it time that we come together and embrace the, embrace the community of the one new man? Because of Christ, we share history. We share the history of the past, the present, and our wonderful future according to Scripture. Sure, we have different foods and, and, and we have different dialects and different expressions, but our culture is kingdom culture. Never, ever, ever should we ever say what my pastor said once a long time ago when he said, we don't celebrate resurrection because we do Passover. And why should I be condemned for celebrating the incarnation on the very day when most of the world is, is singing his praises? No, he wasn't born on December 25th, but does that really matter when we can celebrate together the miracle of the incarnation? Friends, there's only one kingdom community, and it should not be separated by the holidays that we celebrate, especially since we're celebrating the king of the kingdom. <laughs> Listen, guys, we have the privilege and the responsibility to embrace God's anointed times of meetings as the one new man. We shouldn't have to adopt rituals and traditions of others. We have the new wine, so let's put it into a new wineskin. For instance, I loved when I did a Passover with a friend of mine from down south, a real southern belle, and out came her Passover dessert, key lime pie. I never heard of such a thing for Passover, but why not? That was her culture. So, when the one new man can rejoice together in God's appointed times, worshiping Jesus in spirit, truth, love, and humility, then the manifold mystery of God will finally be revealed. Well, that's just one blessing, developing a community of the kingdom. Well, number two, Celebrating provides times to meet with God and each other. The recurring theme in, in God's appointed feast is rest. E either do no regular work or do no work at all. Through his appointed times, God invites his people to lay aside the distractions of life and just to turn and focus on him. Do you really want to decline such an invitation? I don't. And that leads us to number three. Celebrating God's appointed times together enables our spiritual growth, not only for ourselves, but for the next generation. Remembering what God did in the past not only gives us hope, but it gives the next generation hope. And that's why we hear over and over, teach your children. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart, in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. The key word there, teach. And it is best defined in this passage to sharpen or to whet as a sword. And the use of the tense of the verb indicates intensive or intentional. And this is the great responsibility of the parents on the holidays not simply to teach children to obey instructions, 
but to love the Lord God with all of our being. And it's that love which motivates us to obey. And these are just a few of the blessings when we choose to meet with God at his appointed times and places. And going back again to New Covenant, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Have I convinced you yet? So what happened? What happened? Well, the problem started rearing its ugly head, which caused the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. The Apostle Paul had brought the gospel to the Gentiles, many of whom responded with great joy. Churches were planted throughout Asia and Europe. But while I hope the apostles were rejoicing, there was consternation and confusion. What do we do with these Gentiles? What were they required to do to follow Yeshua? Certainly not the law of Moses, as God had promised a new covenant, a covenant which transcended Moses. And interestingly, celebration of the feast wasn't mentioned in their conclusions because it wasn't a have to, it was a blessing to go ahead and do it. But meanwhile, the Gentiles themselves were breaking away from the Jerusalem church. Paul had to remind them of God's unique relationship with Israel. In fact, Paul spent much effort to challenge and chastise the Romans. So how did this confusion start? Well, even before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, remember Paul was dealing with this issue and he died in 67, honorable men began the cry against the Jewish people. Now, we need to remember that these men had a tremendous and a good impact on the church. But they had a blind spot, a blind spot that created and sustained the breach of the one new man. Listen to some of the things they said. Ignatius, oppose all things Jewish. The Hebrew prophets lived according to Jesus Christ and not according to the Jewish law. That's interesting. We have no need of such an obsolete practice. It's wrong to talk about Jesus Christ and live like Jews. Well, there it is, right there. No more appointed feasts of the Lord. And then came Constantine. Let us have nothing to do with the most hostile Jews. And then there is St. John Christopherson who said, it is the duty of Christians to hate the Jews. He who can never love Christ enough will never have done fighting against those who hate him. Yet there were still some Gentiles who kept celebrating the Passover. After all, they knew they were commemorating the death, burial, and resurrection of their Savior. How could they not celebrate? So, of course, the feasts became part of the rant against the Jews. The Laodicean Synod forbade Christians from observing the biblical Sabbath. And then the Council of Nicaea changed the calendar itself to make sure that resurrection came before Passover. Now, how does the resurrection come before the death and the burial of Christ? So now the Jewish believers faced a dilemma, a dilemma that defied reason since the very savior they were worshiping in his original church were all Jewish. Simply, from 70 AD to this very day, demonically inspired hatred of the Jews and ignorance of God's unique relationship with Israel has led to the misinterpretation of the Bible, erroneous theology and terrible lies which have resulted in the massacres of Jewish people, all done in the name of the church. As oppose all things Jewish was written in the minds and hearts of many believers, oppose all things Christian has become part of the DNA of the Jewish people, even some Jewish believers. 
Now, although we're called to understand and repair this terrible breach, we need to save that for another time. What we can do and do with joy is restore the Lord's appointed times and celebrate Jesus as the one new man. And remember the key, the key is who we are celebrating, not how we are celebrating. Keep Jesus preeminent and have fun. Be creative, develop new traditions, but keep them biblical. Dare I say, throw out those bunnies and eggs on resurrection and let them be a reflection of your culture. What is important, my friend, is being obedient to what God is telling you and in doing so with grace and humility, most of all love for one another. And that concludes my introduction to the whole topic of can the church celebrate the Feast of the Lord? And of course, of course, of course is the answer. And so once again, I tell you about this 12 week course that I have put together that will enable us to look at scripture. What are all the feasts? How do we see Jesus? How did Jesus fulfill them? And how do we find their significance for us today? We can, we'll dialogue and most fun is we can come up with new recipes, new traditions, new ideas on how we can celebrate the feasts, how you can celebrate the feasts where you are. And please don't forget to go to my website, www.novea.org, and there you can subscribe to our two YouTube channels, Joan Lippis and Lunchtime Prayer for Israel. You can contact me. I would love to come and, and facilitate a Passover Seder in your home or in your church. Maybe bring a, the seminar of repairing the breach. And don't forget to check out the prayer journey through Israel because these are very, very special times of interacting with Israelis and breaking down some of these spiritual strongholds through prayer and, of course, worship. And so with that, I do want to remind you to look at the course. The, the link is right here on your screen. And with that, I do say, Lehitra Ot and Shalom from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm.